Welcome to the virtual introduction to the Plant Kingdom Lab. Our first topic is to dive into the four major groups of plants, the mosses, the ferns, gymnosperms, and angiosperms. Now plants are largely multicellular photosynthetic organisms. So that means they can take sunlight and convert it into food, carbohydrates and fats, which we call biological molecules. So that ability to do photosynthesis largely ties this group together. So plants are widely believed to have evolved from single-celled protists that can also do photosynthesis called algae. So on the right here, I have a few pictures of some algae cells. There's all different types. And uh, this evolutionary event is uh, thought to have occurred around 450 million years ago. So you can think of green algae, which are still around today, as the, the ancestors of all modern plants. And as we go through the four major groups of plants, we're largely going to focus on changes in their reproductive strategies or adaptations like, for instance, seeds and flowers and fruits that have improved the reproductive success of these various groups. So we're going to go through these four groups in an evolutionary sense, starting with the most primitive group, the mosses, and then finally ending with the most successful, recent, advanced group, the angiosperms, also known as the flowering plants. So here we're starting with the mosses. They're primitive in the sense that they're most related to the green algae. Okay, they are lacking a few features that most modern plants have. One of those features that they lack, they don't have veins in a sense. They don't have what we call vascular tissue. So they don't have xylem and phloem which are basically cells that help the plant to transport things like water, minerals, and food, like sugar, like sap. Okay, so mosses don't have those veins. So they can't move nutrients and water up and down, like from the roots to the stems. They don't even have a stem. They don't even have roots. So they're really short. They grow really close to the ground in mats. And the reason for that is because they don't have vascular tissue. They're also highly dependent on water. So they need water not only for survival, but uh, for reproduction, because the sperm has to be in a thin film of water to swim to the egg. So you will only find mosses growing in damp, dark, moist places. So they need water. And lastly, uh, they reproduce by releasing spores, which we'll talk about later on. And spores are different than seeds. So think of spores as a, the more primitive means of reproduction for the plant kingdom. And there is one other group that you are responsible for knowing that is closely related to the mosses. And those are called the liverworts. I have one shown here. And we are ready to move on to group number two. So a little bit more advanced, more successful. These are the ferns. And this is really the first group to have a vascular system. So they have veins, they have xylem and phloem. And because of that, they can grow a bit bigger. They can have a stem, they can have leaves, they can have roots and they can outcompete other organisms like mosses, for instance, because they can better reach sunlight and nutrients in the ground. Still um, primitive in the sense that they reproduce by releasing spores instead of seeds, right? So you won't find a fern with a seed or a fern with a fruit, it doesn't exist. They reproduce using spores. Still relatively dependent on water, 
think about where you might find a fern growing. Usually a rainforest of some sort, whether it be temperate or tropical. Any place where there's shade and a lot of water. And uh, if you have a fern or you've seen a fern leaf, which we call a frond when we're talking about ferns, if you turn it over, you can see all these little brown dots like you can see here in the center picture. Each little brown dot actually holds like 64 spores. And those are released to help the uh, fern reproduce. Moving on to group number three, the gymnosperms, which in Greek means naked seed. And that is because the seeds of these plants are not enclosed, completely enclosed by tissue. Okay, so they don't have fruits where the, the seed is completely surrounded. Instead of a fruit, they have a cone where the seed is more exposed to the environment. So one thing that ties this whole group together is that they reproduce using reproductive structures called cones. They all have cones, like think of pine tree cone. And there's all different types of cones. So this group includes the conifers, which includes um, well-known species like pine trees, fir trees, cypresses, redwoods. Okay, they all reproduce using cones. And then also some lesser known groups like the cycads, which I'll get to in a moment. So not only do they reproduce using cones, it's also the first group of plants to utilize seeds and pollen as well. So they were the first group of plants to use pollination to help better facilitate and help their chances of sexual reproduction. And since this is still a relatively, in a sense, primitive group, 360 million years ago is when they first came about, there actually weren't pollinators even around yet. Okay, the insects weren't around yet, hummingbirds weren't around, bats weren't around. So they had to have means of uh, transporting their pollen from one species to the other without the help of other organisms. So that is why they primarily disperse their pollen using uh, physical factors like the wind or gravity. So we're gonna take a closer look here at cones. So here are the cycads that I was talking about. Doesn't really look like you know a redwood or a pine tree, but actually closely related. These are cycads, also known as sago palms. They look like palm trees, but they are not. Palm trees are actually flowering plants. And you can see right here, this is a female cycad. It's got this humongous cone in the center. And it's sort of like a pine tree cone. Each, those are many little scales, basically. And at the base of each scale is um, a female reproductive structure called an egg, which is contained within something called an ovule. Not shown here, but there are also male cycads that have male cones that release pollen and the goal is for the pollen to land on the egg and uh, fertilize it and to facilitate reproduction generating a cycad seed which will fall off this cone and grow into a new cycad. So I want you to understand at this point that cones are reproductive structures that facilitate sexual reproduction for the plant. Again, pollen is produced from and released from the male cones. Eggs are located on the female cones. And here's a more familiar example for you. We're still talking about gymnosperms here. Here's a conifer, specifically a pine tree. And I'm sure you've seen a female pine cone now these aren't um, shown to scale, so male pine cones are really small. Each one of those is like half an inch long. These are about, you know, could be up to a foot long. But um, these are the scales I was talking about, and at the base of each scale is an egg. And since these are the male pine cones, those are full of pollen, and the goal is for that pollen to get transferred to the egg. So same concept as we were talking about here, 
just a different species, slightly different cone. And the last group, and this is gonna be the focus of our lab this week. This group is referred to as the angiosperms, which in Greek means seed within a vessel. Basically, a seed that is completely surrounded by tissue, in this case, a fruit. So all angiosperm species have flowers and fruits. Not only that, they have all the other structures that we talked about previously. They have vascular tissue, they have seeds, and they have pollen. So this is by far the most successful group. And when I say successful, they're really good at surviving compared to other groups of plants, and they're really good at reproducing and uh, colonizing new areas. So um, 90% of all plants currently living on Earth today belong to this group. So we have two examples here on the right, just pretty, you know, angiosperms. Um, we have a hibiscus on the bottom and a plumeria on the top. So um, we are ready for topic number two. We're going to be talking all about angiosperms for a while here. And the first thing we want to talk about is the basic structure of a flower. I want you to realize a flower is analogous in function and in structure to a cone. Okay, so it's a reproductive structure and its job is to facilitate reproduction. So it is going to be both the site of pollination, which we'll talk about, and the site of fertilization. And then finally, the dispersal of fruits and seeds. So our first topic here, as you can see in the bottom, it says in bold, let's go over the four layers and structures of a flower together. And uh, we're gonna do that. We're gonna jump over here and I have our flower. And we're gonna start outwards and work our way in, okay? So the first of these four layers of a flower shown here are called the sepals, okay? These usually look like leaves and their job is to protect the developing flower bud before it's bloomed. And then when it blooms, they kind of peel back, as you can see here. Okay, so that's the first layer. It doesn't really have anything to do with reproduction, more like just protecting the reproductive layers inside. And if we move inward, we have layer number two. This is the layer that you're most familiar, familiar with. You'd probably associate this layer with the flower itself. These are the petals. And oftentimes the petals are fragrant in a positive way, you know, to attract pollinators, whether it be a mammal or a bird or an insect, usually colorful. Many times there's actually like maps or arrows in a sense on the flower that humans, mammals can't see, but insects might be able to see um, because it's like infrared radiation and it's uh, patterns pointing to where the food is, where the nectar is, you know, where the pollen is. Okay, so the job of the petals is to attract other organisms to facilitate reproduction for the plant. And then if we dive inside the petals, we have the two reproductive layers. The first is the male reproductive layer, shown here in orange. They are called stamens. Okay, we have six of them here. And uh, since these are the male reproductive layers, this is where the production and the release of pollen occurs. All right, so there's two parts here. There's kind of like this thin stalk that's called the, the filament. And then at the top of that thin stalk, which I'll put a little box around, okay, that darker orange, that is called the uh, anther, so that's like part of the stamen. And that's where pollen 
is uh, produced. And uh, if you don't know what pollen is at this point in time, that's okay, we'll get to it later on. So that's it for the male layer. Now we have one more layer to go. It's the innermost layer. The border of it here is drawn in green. This is called the pistil. The innermost layer, this is the female layer of the plant. And uh, there are several smaller parts of the pistil that we're gonna cover here. The first is at the top. This part right here, this is called the stigma. And as we're gonna learn, this is where pollen lands during pollination. And it kind of kicks off the reproductive events that occur. Okay, so the goal is for pollen to land there. It's usually sticky. Then this um, kind of vertical stalk that leads up to the stigma, that's called the style. So also part of the pistil. And then usually very deep in the flower at the base of it, I'm going to put a box around it so you know what I'm talking about. This right here, it's kind of a green oval with these um, orange circles inside. This is called the, uh, the ovary of the flower. So very important, this is where fertilization is going to occur. So this, again, this green oval-shaped structure is called the ovary. And you'll notice there are six orange little circles within the ovary. Each of these orange little circles is referred to as an ovule. And uh, within each ovule is a special reproductive cell, kind of analogous to sperm or pollen, called an egg. So each ovule contains An egg. So you might be, you might have noticed this. Um, angiosperms are unique. Many times they can have um, species that have both uh, the male and reproductive. I'm sorry, the male and female reproductive parts on the same flower. So not all species are like that, but many are. We refer to them as uh, complete flowers because of that. Certainly uh, advantageous. You know, they can um, pollinate and reproduce with themselves in addition to with other plants. But um, yeah, that's a feature of angiosperms. And uh, just to show you what I'm talking about, I'm gonna put an egg in yellow within each ovule. So there's six of them. It's not always the case. Sometimes you have an ovary with just one ovule, you know? Like think like a peach, a fruit, right? A peach, it has the pit. That's the one ovule that was inside the ovary. Just depends on what plant you're talking about. And that is it for basic flower structure. We are going to jump back to our PowerPoint slides. You have the same image here from your textbook. Here we just have uh, written descriptions of those four layers. Since I said all this verbally, just previously, I'm not going to say it again, but please read that on your own time. And now we're ready for the next section. It's only one slide long. Very important though, and that is why are the angiosperms so much more successful than the other three groups of plants? Okay, so there's two primary reasons for their reproductive success. The first and the most important is their symbiotic relationships with other organisms, which we call pollinators, which includes many different insects, the most well-known and important being bees, beetles, butterflies, moths, but also mammals, you know, bats, especially at night, certain marsupials, 
birds, like hummingbirds, there's oftentimes many cases where there's a single plant species that has only one symbiotic relationship with another animal. And without each other, they really wouldn't thrive and uh, survive at such high rates. So this word symbiotic means both individuals that are partaking in the relationship benefit. Okay? So the pollinator benefits because it's visiting the flower not to help the flower reproduce. It's visiting the flower to get food, energy, you know, for its metabolism. So that can be in the form of many things. You know, it could be the fruit, but oftentimes it's nectar. And sometimes they can eat the pollen itself. It's going to have carbohydrates oftentimes, you know, rich in energy. But uh, inadvertently, when the pollinator visits the uh, flower, it's going to touch and rub up against the male structures, you know, the stamens, and it's going to touch the pollen. And then when that pollinator goes to another flower of the same species, it's going to rub that pollen on the female part of the other flower, facilitating sexual reproduction for the plant. So that's how the plant benefits. It gets to just sit there, right? They're um, uh, sessile, they can't move, right? But it gets this animal to help it reproduce with other plants that are could be miles away, you know? So that's how both benefit. And our second reason for the success of the angiosperms has to do with fruits. Okay, so fruits, as we're going to learn, originate from flowers. Okay, they're like a mature, fertilized flower, in a sense. Um, but fruits are oftentimes very energy rich. I'm sure as you know, that's why they're so tasty to humans. Um, can include carbohydrates, good unsaturated fats, you know, protein, everything you need. And uh, it's not just humans that can benefit from that. Any animals can benefit by eating fruits. And when they do so, they oftentimes in nature swallow the seeds, you know, because the seeds are inside the fruit. And it goes through the digestive tract of the animal, oftentimes um, gets excreted as feces, and uh, those indigestible seeds then get dumped in a new location, right, in the soil with, like, fertilizer. And that can help it grow into a, you know, a new plant. So this process of animals eating fruits and dispersing seeds in other places allows plants to colonize new regions. Then lastly, in the bottom right, I have a, just a video. I could have picked dozens of videos, but I picked a, a bat. So it's a picture of a bat acting as a pollinator and uh, doing so at night. And uh, you can see how that works. And they talk about the symbiotic relationship between the bat and its um, plant that it pollinates. Next section, breaking down the angiosperms into two groups, the monocots and the dicots. As you're going to learn when you complete this lab, a majority of this lab has to do with distinguishing between these two types of angiosperms. Okay, and they each have characteristic features that will help you to do so. And I've summarized all those features here in this table and in, in these pictures. So monocot is short for mono, kind of a tongue twister, monocotyledon, which means this particular variety of an angiosperm only has one embryonic leaf inside the seed. And it's easy to remember Monocots in their seeds, since they only have one embryonic leaf, their seeds do not split in half. So think of seeds that don't split in half. Like, for instance, a corn kernel, monocot, as opposed to one that splits in half, indicating that it has two embryonic leaves. Something like, for instance, uh, a lima bean, you know, splits in two, or a peanut. 
So that's one, that's really where the naming comes from, but that's also a way to distinguish the two groups from one another. The other primary way to distinguish monocot versus dicot is to look at their flower parts, like the various layers that we looked at, sepals, petals, you know, stamens. And uh, well, for monocots, those parts of the flower oftentimes come in multiples of three. Whereas if we're talking about a dicot, they come in multiples of four or five. Okay, so that's not, those aren't the only features, but uh, you're gonna learn about several more as you go through the lab. So you can use this as you're going through the lab as a kind of a summary, you know, of those features that you're gonna learn about. Next section. How does pollination and fertilization work in angiosperms? And uh, to help you show how this uh, process works, I think it's best if I jump over to my, my own diagram. I'm gonna use the same flower. And uh, the first thing, first event, we want to go over is something called pollination. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple event. Um, so I'm going to draw my pollen. Let's see, so I was drawing the eggs in yellow. Let's pick a different color for the pollen. So let's say the pollen is uh, red. Okay, so assuming things worked out for the plant, the pollen is going to land on top of the stigma. That's it. That's pollination. Once the pollen grains land on the stigma, this plant has been pollinated. Fertilization is a little bit more complex because there's two aspects to it. And uh, the first aspect is that... Let me like zoom in on one of these pollen grains. Or not zoom in, just kind of like show you what happens. Um, one pollen grain is going to divide and reproduce by a form of cellular reproduction called mitosis. Obviously, we haven't learned about that yet, but it's going to split in two. And it's, it's going to become two new cells. And uh, those two new cells that it becomes are called um, sperm cells. So one pollen grain is going to give rise to two sperm cells. And uh, maybe I'll use a different color for that. So let me erase this. Just to distinguish between the pollen grains and the sperm, let's use purple. Okay, so one of those red dots is going to become two purple dots. And uh, basically, a few things are going to happen. First, part of the pollen grain that we're talking about is going to give rise, it's going to grow into this long tube, which I'm drawing in red. It's going to go all the way down the pistil, down into the ovary, until it reaches one of the six ovules in this case. And it's basically like a tunnel that will allow those two sperm cells to travel all the way down from the stigma until they get down here to the ovule. What's going to happen is one of those sperm is going to fertilize the egg. And just like in animals, just like in most species, that's going to give rise to, in this case, the baby plant or um, the plant embryo. But that's not it. Um, there's two fertilization events. So plants are kind of unique in this sense. Right? There's two sperm cells involved. So our next question is, what is the point of that second sperm cell? What is that going to give rise to? And to show you that, it will be easier to jump back to our PowerPoint slides. So let me just kind of um, discuss what's happening here in this slide. What do we have here? This represents one of our pollen grains. And if you didn't know this, pollen's living. It's composed of two cells, one bigger cell and then one smaller cell right there, kind of like oval shaped. 
and basically um, the smaller cell is the one that gives rise to the two sperm. So it becomes the two sperm. This big cell around it becomes that pollen tube shown here in yellow. So they give rise to all of that. It gives rise to the pollen tube and the two sperm that travel down it until they reach, shown here, one of the ovules with the egg inside and achieve um, fertilization. So what happens here, right, there's two sperm. So one of them, as we said, is going to fertilize the egg and become the plant embryo. The other sperm is going to fertilize another cell located within the ovule. You don't need to know its name, but you do need to know what it becomes. And it becomes, after it fertilizes the structure here, something called an endosperm. You may have never heard of it, but I'm pretty sure you've eaten it before. Um, it's the reason that um, seeds are so nutritious. So the endosperm is not really a living structure. It's a nutrient source for the plant embryo. So it contains all types of food molecules, rich in carbohydrates like starch, oils, also known as unsaturated fats, which, you know, make things like almonds and soybeans and any seed so healthy and also usually rich in proteins. Okay, so all the nutrition you get from a seed is because of that endosperm. Okay, so one of the sperms becomes the endosperm, the nutrient source. And as we said, the other sperm is going to become the baby plant, the plant embryo. All right, so that's what we mean by double fertilization. Now, you might, this might already be becoming clear to you, um, these structures in the ovule are going to develop into a seed. Okay, so the ovule, if you go back to, um, let's see, I want to go back to my picture here. If you look at that orange structure, okay, I'm going to put a circle around it. That's going to become a seed. So if everything goes to plan, um, there's going to become there's going to be six seeds here, you know. So going back, the ovule becomes the seed. And then basically the ovary, which is that whole big circle around all six ovules, right? I can put a box around it again. The ovary after fertilization, so basically after all of these six ovules become fertilized, is going to mature into the fruit. Okay, so that's what I meant earlier by, um, in a sense, flowers become fruits. That's pretty much always true. So you should know that. You should know this. You know the ovule becomes the seed, the whole ovary becomes the fruit. And um, obviously, there's many different types of fruits, but there's two general classes: fleshy fruits and dry fruits. So fleshy fruits are ones that you may um, associate as fruits, you know, things like a, an orange or a peach or an apple, right? There's that flesh in between the seeds and the outside of the fruit. But also there's dry fruits, okay? So I want you to realize all nuts, almonds, walnuts, cashews, any nut, that's a fruit. But it just so happens that the... Um, the edge of the fruit fuses with the seed and they become one. So there's no space between the outside of the fruit and the seed. Also, all grains are dry fruits. So wheat, oats, corn, barley, fruits, dry fruits. So we, you know, as humans, we are very dependent on this group of plants for agriculture, for nutrition. And our last uh, subject here is the basic structure of a seed. And it's pretty straightforward. Think of, again, the seed is the fertilized and slightly matured ovule. Okay, so the ovule gives rise to this structure. 
So we said one of the components of the ovule is the baby plant, the plant embryo. And you can see that right here in um, light brown. The second component of the seed is the food source for that plant embryo. The technical term is the endosperm, and it basically surrounds the embryo shown here in orange. So just to kind of tie everything together, this would be a dicot. And I could tell because it has two little leaves right there. So this, this seed would split in two, you know? Its flower parts would be in multiples of four or five. And uh, if you look at the bottom, it says, let's go over seed structure together. And it's kind of the same thing. I just wanted to show you it from a different point of view. Here's our seed. It has two primary components. The first, which is pretty clear, is the plant embryo. In this case, again, it's a dicot. It has two embryonic leaves. It has a little bit of roots, you know, that are starting to grow. But as it sits here in this seed, this capsule, it can wait things out for a long time. It can remain dormant. You know, if we're talking about desert plants, it can remain dormant for centuries even. Okay, so it can pause growth and just kind of hang out until the environmental conditions outside are suitable for it to burst open this seed coat, burst through the soil and grow and start doing photosynthesis. And one thing that allows it to kind of wait things out is this tremendous amount of food around it. Now it's not purple, but just using purple, that represents the endosperm, the nutrient source. And all of this is encapsulated within the seed coat, which will break open usually when exposed to certain conditions, especially a certain amount of water. So that's it for seed structure. And uh, lastly, I wanna say one of the, um, First observations you're going to make in the lab is distinguishing uh, a spore from a seed. Remember I said spores are kind of a more ancient, primitive, less successful way to reproduce? Well, one difference between a spore and a seed is a spore is just one cell. As we're going to learn in this class, a single cell, that's pretty small. Just one cell. Can't even see it with your naked eye. Whereas a seed, it's huge, okay? It's like this capsule with all this food and all these resources and it's got the baby plant embryo in there and it basically the plant ejects this seed out into the environment and sends it off, but it gives it this protection and this food that will allow it to survive harsh conditions until it's ready, you know, to breach through the soil and start living. So they're extremely different. Obviously the seed is much, much larger because that plant embryo is like thousands to millions of cells large as opposed to just one cell. That is it for the Plant Kingdom introduction. Thank you for listening.